Coming up on almost one year since the election of President Biden, the effect of Donald Trump's presidency on our culture continues to linger on all of our collective psyche. But has it broken us? It seems like we were putting a whole bunch of our hang-ups like racism on the back burner before 2016 when we had the leadership of a coalition of young people and minorities. But were we truly? This week, I'm joined by author and professor of history, African-American studies, and gender studies at East Tennessee State University. Politicon's excited to welcome Dr. Elwood Watson to look at the political tides influencing our sense of racial identity and national cohesion. Have we become more conscientious and empathetic while integrating all demographics of people into our politics? Or are there things that we still need to be doing to give people a stake in the places they live? And how the heck are we gonna get along? Are you in Tennessee right now? Yes, I am. I'm in Johnson City, Tennessee, which is East Tennessee. I'm in the mountains about yes. an hour from North Carolina, an hour from Virginia. So it's in a pretty part of the country, beautiful part of the country. Beautiful part, but um, but quiet and isolated, yeah? Is that... Um, isolated, yes and no. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, we're about two hours from Knoxville and we're about four hours from Atlanta. Where's so Bristol? Is, a, um, is Bristol close? Is that oh, the close city? Yes, yes. Bristol, like Bristol, there's half of Bristol's in Tennessee and half of it's in Virginia. Bristol's about 40 minutes from me, okay, uh, so the Tennessee side. That's where the, that's Bristol. where you go if you need to get something. Uh, no, right here in Tri City, Johnson City's got quite a bit. We got a university here, and you know, so it's a, it's got a lot more retirees are moving up here from Florida and places. I guess the cost of living's not too too bad, and and it's um the weather uh, like nicer. anything else. You know, you're getting you're dealing with um things creeping up in prices once outsiders come in. You know, the things get more expensive, so you know oh, that works. And I live in I live in Raleigh, so I'm very well aware. Of oh, okay, happens. so you know, you see yeah. about. Three and a half, four hours from me. So, you know, okay. North so, Carolina is a beautiful state, too. It is. But you're from Delaware, yeah? That's correct. Okay. Um, what what took you to Tennessee then? Just just school or? No, um, I got a job offer here at, at the university in 1997, and I've been here since. And um, I uh, got my doctorate, um, my BA and my bachelor's, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree from the University of Delaware, and I got my PhD from the University of Maine. And there was a job offer here at East Tennessee State University, and I was a fit for the position and um, came down and interviewed and um, got the job. And like I said, I've been here ever since. I teach history, African-American studies, and uh, gender, sexuality studies. Yeah, so I'm looking, I look at your, your CV or your resume, and I think he, he does everything. What did you, <laughs> you, you know, you know it all. What did you go to, um, what did you go to school for? What's your uh, PhD? What'd you, what would you, what'd you write your dissertation in? Uh, black women in the legal academy since Brown v. Board. What I looked at was the first and uh, second generation of women, uh, significant number of black women law professors who entered the academy, the legal academy, and interviewed about 17 of them more, you know, and um, interviewed them and found out their experiences and their, um, you know, the dynamics and dilemmas they went through. And the book is called Outsiders Within, Black Women in the Legal Academy after Brown v. Board. So I look at the first, you know, two generations of post- 19, uh, I guess you could say 60, generally, law professors, uh, women, black women, legal scholars who are in the profession. I interviewed Kimberly Crenshaw, Lonnie Guineer, uh, Paulette Caldwell, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, many, Anita Allen, many others, and um, uh, several others, well, I guess about 15 to 20, and got their life experiences and some of the things they had endured in, 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 in the legal academy. And the challenges that they faced, I'm sure, Correct. are... are enough to fill a book but hey you did it um you filled the book <laughs> but um it's it's i would hope that that field the the legal field has improved for women for minorities since brown um in 1950 something um is it 54 54 um see you're the doctor um not me <laughs> but uh, are are there there's still Challenge. What are the, what are the challenges that still need to be overcome in that specific field? Uh, the challenges are like anything else, you know. Being black women and women, they had to deal with racism and sexism, so they had to deal with all those dynamics and um, just 
dealing with the constant, you know, um, I hate to use this term microaggressions because I don't think that I don't like the term micro. I think they're not micro. Micro means miniature. <laughs> you know, to me, I think macroaggressions is a better word. And just dealing with, you know, the slights, the, you know, the, the occasional disrespect, passive aggressive behavior. I mean, so there's a lot of things that, you know, that they have to deal with on a regular basis. Was it passive aggressive, and, uh, though, in the, fi- in the 40s and 50s? I would imagine it was more oh, aggressive oh, aggressive, well, right? <laughs> no, and in the in the nineteen forties, fifties there weren't any there'd probably be maybe one or two. Sadie Alexander, but um they would they wouldn't have been even been into law schools in the forties and fifties. That was it because that was, you know, pre Brown. So but I'm talking about the generation of times they were entering the law schools. A lot of these women were entering the nineteen seventies and uh the first first significant wave. Uh or at least, you know, it's never been a large number, but the seventies and the eighties and a few in the nineties. But these individuals by the time they were entering in the seventies and the eighties, uh, you know, uh, uh uh it was very, you know, um they were like the new 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 people on the block, you know, like the new family moving into the neighborhood and um, the first black family moving to the neighborhood. I'm using that kind of analogy. And they had to deal with a lot of, um, uh, you know, suspe- suspicions, assumptions. I would and, assume it was overt, uh, though, was it not? I mean, for a lot of folks in the 70s. For some of the earlier, for some of the earlier women, yes, yeah, some of it was overt. But it was also, you got to realize, this was the time after the civil rights movement, uh, Dr. Martin King Jr.'s death had only been a few years and things as well. So there was also a degree of um, not the kind of overt, blatant hostility they may have faced, would have faced in the 1950s. This does not mean it would not have been uh, racism, of course, but by the 70s and early 80s, it could have been more passive aggressive too, you know, um, as well. Because um, I think some people, even hardcore racists by that time, were not going to be the type of, you know, um, um, probably as blatant in their discrimination and their hostility as they would have been maybe decades earlier. Some would, would be though. Some would be, you're correct. So, so just not, not focusing solely on women in the legal profession, but generally on racism in America. Um, Do you think it's followed a similar arc? Um, Obviously throughout Jim Crow South, we're talking overt blatant racism um, and then in the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, more passive aggressive. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want you to jump in. H- has there been, is there a difference today than there was in, in, in the racism that we see in America today than the type of racism that we saw in America in the 80s and 90s or the 70s, 80s and 90s, where it was a little more passive aggressive? Do you think it's gotten more openly aggressive today? Do you think it's gotten more taboo to be seen as racist? How do you think things have changed now? Well, it's more, it's very complex. By that, I mean, um, during the 80s, you heard the Reagan years, and you remember, remember Ronald Reagan started off his 1980 presidential campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The significance of that was that year at that time, only 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney were murdered in Neshoba County. He talked about states' rights. As you can imagine, among many progressives, that sent shock waves and chills uh, because that was a very, very uh, chilling message to talk about states' rights in Philadelphia, Mississippi, given what had happened, that tragedy in 1964. So the 80s was a time of, it was anti-blackness in the country uh, that was really kind of overt. And by the 90s, the Clinton years come in and people are much more, the Clinton administration is much more open to diversity, multiculturalism, and you see that in his presidential staff and his selection of cabinet uh, 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 members and the likes. It's also at that time where a lot of institutions are really beginning to re-examine their uh, diversity makeup of their of their of their uh, uh, professions. Academia was exactly one of those situations or uh, professions. And that was a major reason why there was a big push in academia to start diversifying faculty. Uh, academia had a record reputation of being liberal, but its hiring policies were very, very, very 
uh, limited as far as bringing in diversity. So by the 90s, what you're seeing is much more of a openness and uh, less reluctance among hardcore racists, at least in the early years of the 90s, to espouse blatantly racist uh, rhetoric. Now, by 1994, when the Republicans under then Speaker of the House elect Newt Gingrich take over both houses of Congress, uh, there are attacks on affirmative action and other uh, 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 other policies that have been used uh, or been uh, supposedly supported by the Democratic Party. But are as we well. are we so? I mean, obviously there are, there are, uh, there are examples of racism throughout history. I mean, I, I'm just saying culturally, have we progressed? In, by 2008 in the election of, a, of the first black president, that's obviously progress from uh, Ronald Reagan's <laughs> campaign in 1980 to some degree. But it feels like, you know, as I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, um, as a white man in the South who would not have exposure to racism um, for, uh, for those obvious reasons, I don't quite remember hearing as much discussion of it. Um, and I know that now we hear a lot more and for good reason, because people are finally standing up and speaking out about it. Um, and those voices are being heard. Is it having an effect in the way that it needs to, though? Is it is it diminishing racism? Because as much as I'm hearing a lot of minorities speak up and speak out about the rights that they deserve, that everyone deserves. And as much as I hear allies like myself speaking up and saying, yes, we absolutely have to change some of the systemic racism in America. I'm also hearing a lot more, a lot, a lot more aggressive language from the other side than I can remember hearing in the eighties and nineties. And it's almost as if though some progress has been made, but then on the other side, maybe there's not been as much. And I'm trying to kind of, I would love to know why. Um, if you have any idea from your experience in research, why have we gotten progressive and equality minded on one side, but yet the other side's now getting a little bit louder than they ever were? Well, I think the, uh, the election of Donald Trump certainly gave um, license to be much more uh, vocally aggressive to people who harbor these racist, sexist. Did he give license xenophobic... to it or did they give license to him? I mean, it's a which came first, the chicken or the egg I... thing, right? Sort of. I think that um, I think it was maybe mutual, but I think he and his campaign in 2015, uh, one of the first things he talked about were Mexicans. You remember he said Mexicans, oh, yeah. rapists, they come over, commit crimes and da, da, da. But some of them, I would say, are good people. So when you start off your campaign, presidential campaign with that type of xenophobic racist rhetoric. Oh, without I mean, question, he was a jackass to... and a dick. Um, <laughs> we can just say that for the record. But <laughs> the question that I, I ask is, I wonder if it's dangerous. I mean, it's really easy to blame everything on him. I mean, I know him. I'd be happy to blame it all on him. But I wonder if we're missing if we're missing the the root of the problem by taking the easy road and blaming it on him versus recognizing uh, Maybe he didn't start it. Maybe he just was the result of it. I mean, how did he get elected if not for the fact that there were a lot of people in this country who liked the shit he was saying about Mexicans and black people and all minorities? I mean, that he didn't teach them to have that hatred, did he? He, he just fed off of their own. No, right? no, not at all. What, no, I mean, exactly. I mean, no, racism was certainly a large before Donald Trump, when he was even born. But the reality is he did give it, he gave permission. I think individuals who at his rally, the, 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 the comments he used and stuff as well, he always said there was always a body of people out there who felt that way. But I do think Trump, they saw in Trump a candidate who was willing to speak what they thought and only things they would, the, the kind of rhetoric that they would largely speak among themselves or among like-minded friends where they would not necessarily use that type of language publicly, but Trump gave them permission or they felt it was okay to enact upon those behaviors 
in the public sphere because we have somebody who is actually running for president. And but so many of them well voted known. for Obama too, right? Mm, no, I don't know many. I, I would I won't say I would, I would say many. I would say a segment. Well, certainly enough. Uh, it's certainly enough for Trump to have won back at least four states, if not five, that Obama won. I mean, certainly in the hundreds of thousands in order to make those some of those states like Michigan and Wisconsin and North Carolina and Pennsylvania flip back over to, to Trump, right? So a good well, number. Not, well, no, I would say what, what, what happened there was more of those individuals, uh, a lot what happened in 2016, a lot of people did not vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton was not a popular candidate, even among large segments of the left particularly younger blacks. Uh, a lot of women didn't care for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, the, 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 okay, the, the, the Bernie, the Bernie, um, um, the, you know, the, uh, the Bernie Sanders crowd, you know, I heard a lot of people saying, well, I'm not going to vote for Hillary because Bernie's my man and I don't like how she did this. And so the, a lot of those individuals stayed home. I think the assumption was that Donald Trump was not going to win regardless. And then the next day when they woke up and they looked on their cell phones or saw the news, and, you know, it said President Trump. You know, like well, that. and they uh, cried for a, a week. Out, they cried know, for exactly. four years, but and then they showed out on mass, right in 2020, and even still, though, with record-breaking turnout, even still, yeah, yeah. even still, Joe Biden really only won by less than eighty thousand votes in those states. Uh, where he took it back. So we are far more divided. It can't possibly all be about race, can it? Not all of it. Uh, I think a lot of the segments, uh, a lot of it has been race. But uh, I want to uh, go back a little bit, though. What happened was, I think, in 2016, a lot of those people did not vote. Uh, people did not vote, period. But I think the Trump base was more galvanized. And I think a lot of it was due to what Hillary Clinton it was just um, a bad candidate. Um, not saying she was a bad person. I'm saying she was a bad candidate. And she just simply was not. Uh, there were just too many negatives to get beginning, beginning. I think there was Clinton fatigue. And I'm surprised the Democrat Party would run somebody who you already knew had a, a plus 50 percent negative rating. You know, just had very, very high negatives from the outset. Why would you want to run this person as your nominee? And I think there was also a backlash against the first black president, the Obama years. I think there was some of that going on, too. So I feel there were a number but if there of was factors. Backla- if there was backlash against him, he wouldn't have won re-election just as strongly as he won election. I mean, he said at one point in in his last term that he can't run for a third term, but if he could, he would, and he would win. And I think he probably would have. Um, so, well, so I it, think he, I think. I think he would have possibly won, but I also think that um, I, I think there was also a segment who felt that they did not vote because there's a lot of people out there who felt they had no choice in voting and they weren't going to vote for Obama. They would stay home. They didn't really care for uh, But uh, it seems Mitt like Romney. a lot of Monday Mitt morning Romney. quarterbacking to try to just make it about, uh, you know, Hillary being a bad candidate. So do you think Joe Biden was an exceptionally good candidate? No, but I also think too. But I think that. Um, but I also think that he was. Uh, what happened was he was able to get the black vote and other votes that people saw after four years of Trump. And also too, a lot of black people, particularly older blacks, saw him as Biden's. You know, a loyal soldier to Biden, which he was. And I think a lot of black people in the in the South. Uh, he was so you think the that South they Carolina voted for Biden. him simply because he was the he was Obama's vice president. I think that helped among certain people. I think they felt because it didn't cause change his number. It didn't change his numbers at all in South Carolina. His numbers didn't change. Everybody knew he was Obama. It was enough for him to win the primary. But and that, Jim Clyburn but, came but in. He, no, but he didn't have enough to win the primary until Jim Clyburn came in, right? But so, I'm, I'm getting to it. You know, so Jim Clyburn. I was saying with Jim Clip. That's what I'm saying. When Jim Clyburn came in and said, "We know Joe. We know Joe." You know, I mean, well, you know, that was kind of you know. A wink, wink to the black population and particularly older black population. Like, you know, Joe is who we need right now. And I think a lot of older blacks in the country, you know, our forebears and things were smart enough to realize that this country is still a very deeply racist nation on many levels. So you think the black vote is what got Joe Biden elected? Yes. I mean, well, it got the primary. Because if he had lost, remember, he was primary. His his campaign was very 
um, almost they were about talking about apparently ready throwing in the towel if he had lost South Carolina very poorly. Oh yeah. Because you know at that time Sanders was on a roll. I mean he might have won some states, but you know there were there was doubts about how far he could go. He did, he never really did well in Iowa. But I think Biden placed third or fourth, whatever he was in Iowa. And in 2016, I mean the 2012, pardon me, was he uh, 20 when he ran last. But in time, the general, we, in the general, what what made him win in the general? Um, again, I think what happened in 2016, these same people who, some of those people who did not come out in 2016 came out in 2020. And I feel that there were people, uh, a lot of people, even younger blacks who may not have necessarily, who were maybe more aligned with Sanders and more progressive, uh, candidates realized that the alternative would have been Donald Trump again. So I think a lot of people did not want to necessarily take that opportunity or take that set out like they did in 2016. And and you so you think that again, you think that again, the black votes, what made him that what allowed him to win the general too? then? Yes, I think the the black vote helped propel his candidacy. And I also think the black older black vote in particular was the one that helped him and black women. I think black women have always been the backbone of the Democrat Party for the past, since, at least since the 1970s. Yeah. I think black women, they, well, they did well with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton got 94% well, of look, the black female. You also look at Roy Moore in Alabama, and, and we know that that was, a, that was black exactly. females also. But, you could always count on black women but to I don't think they way. did much in Arizona, <laughs> did they? Well, the black population in Arizona is not large. I right, mean, fair. I mean, but to, but, but to, that end, to that end, and I'm just being devil's advocate here and being a little bit of a bitch for fun. Um, <laughs> to that end, if, if the black vote has that much weight to it, then why would Mississippi have not elected a black person statewide in since Reconstruction? Um, I mean, it, Mississippi has got... Forty some percent of its population is black, but yet it's the most one of the reddest states in the country. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of factors there too. I think a lot of times it is um, gerrymandering. Um, I think no, I said you know, statewide. Um, I said statewide. Oh, statewide. statewide is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, voters. I mean, there's still voter suppression. You know, there's still voter suppression in a lot of ways. A lot of older blacks in some levels may still be intimidated to vote. Uh, unable to get to the polls or um there's also a lot of blacks and not all blacks are necessarily uh liberal in their philosophies either you know i mean a lot of people we're talking 40 some percent of the population of mississippi is is black 26 percent i think of the population of georgia is black i mean arguably just looking at the numbers you could totally disenfranchise half of the black voters in mississippi and still win <laughs> as as they did in Georgia, as Democrats did in Georgia, if it was as simple as assuming that all black voters vote this way and all white voters split amongst the parties. But it's not necessarily true. White voters are more and more increasingly becoming conservative and re- Republican voters. Is that not right? Do you not think that 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 it's do you not think it's sort of true to say that white voters are leaving the Repu- the Democrat Party for the Republican Party more so than they have in decades? Well, I don't know. In 20, apparently, Biden won back the suburban vote in 2020. Uh, you know, he'd lost the vote. He'd, uh, he, uh, in 2016, Trump did win some of the suburban vote, to be sure. But I think in 2020, a lot of particularly suburban women went back to uh, 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 Biden. And even suburban men, white men, uh, went back to Biden in, in, in 2016. There was a couple of polls. So I think that um, I'm not convinced. I think there's more regional issues there. I think the South has always been solidly red, particularly after the civil rights movement of 1964. Lyndon Johnson said himself once he signed legislation to pass, he goes, I realize I've lost the South for at least another generation. And he has for the past three generations. But I feel that um, that had a lot to do with it. And a lot is just deeply ingrained in the culture. Uh, every now and then you do get a state like North Carolina that goes blue. Uh, and um, uh, Yeah, and well. I really and hoped we would go blue this year, too. But we didn't. <laughs> and that's what, didn't. And that's why right. I asked the question, because, I mean, I'm thrilled that Georgia did, but I really wanted it to be us. Um <laughs> And so I'm a little bit pissed that that for whatever reason, Democrats messaging is not resonating with a pretty purple state. Um, yeah. And and I wonder what it is. I mean, the conversation tends to be, at least amongst progressives, often very much around demographics and demographics changing and, and so on and so forth. And I can't help but wonder if maybe we... Like maybe the demographics isn't the only piece of this puzzle here. Um, like, are we doing a good enough job of talking about issues that affect 
all people, regardless of race or gender or ethnicity or religion? Um, or are we doing too much to cater to a group that is growing, um, a demographic group that is growing, but not fast enough to get us to win Senate seats in North Carolina, <laughs> you know, what, what, what's going to fix this? Or how do, we, how do we fix or solve the, the divisions that seem to be growing over racial issues in America? And, and I only say seem to be growing because, like I said earlier, I feel like I, it, it's a part of the conversation far more now than it used to be. How do we, you're, you're, a, you're a professor. <laughs> you, you know these things, you've researched. How do we fix these things? Well, I've written articles. Uh, I write for Medium as well. I'm a contributor for Medium. And uh, I did a piece on uh, kitchen table issues. And um, back in 1992, Jim Carville, who was a campaign manager for Bill Clinton, said, it's the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't use that as title for my article, but I said it's kitchen table issues. I didn't say stupid. <laughs> but I said it's kitchen table issues. And I think the vast majority of Americans across racial lines, at the end of the day, it's about health care. It's about good schools. It's about quality neighborhoods. It's about, you know, safe drinking water. It's about being able to take care of their families. It's about those basic cable, uh, not cable, uh, basic kitchen table issues for a lot of Americans. And so I think are, are we talking about that enough, that. though? No, that's my point. And I'm saying to me, that's what I think that resonates with a what will resonate with a large segment of the America. I think in many ways, um, politicians and the pundits and the cons political consultants and the strategists and the like, they take these focus groups, but I don't think they really gravitate toward the people who, you know, vote as well. I think they kind of go along and they, they not go along, but they interview people who are probably the... Um, focus groups are dumb, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Anybody who will work well, for pizza, don't trust their opinion. <laughs> but they, 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 they tend to, they tend to, I think, they, they tend to, to people who are politically, already politically engaged, who watch politics probably on a 24-7 basis. They don't necessarily get to the person who maybe works two or three jobs. They may not have time to talk to uh, pollsters or whatever, but I think the people who are out here working maybe, you know, are, you know, are raising, you know, several children or, you know, th these type of things as well. These are the individuals where I think the kitchen table issues are going to be the ones that resonate with, they're going to resonate with. And that's a large segment of Americans. And I feel, like I said, if they get, most Americans, if they have their basic creature comforts and they're living day to day, those are going to be things, you know, stuff like Russia and not saying those aren't important, but, you know, uh, that type of stuff is not going to really be of concern if you're a person who has. But it's never really about that specific maybe. story about Russia. It's about. Well, I'm sure that as an example. No, not Russia. No, no, but I'm saying, no, I get your point, but it's never about, it's never necessarily about that Russia story or that obscure military appropriations story. None of the, none of the arguments are ever made about the actual policy. They're made in reference to the policy and how this party or that party or this group or that group is the big bad, big, big bad boogeyman who's going to come and try to eat your children because they feel X way about, I mean, it's never really about the policy. It's about making the other side wrong, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's part of, part of the problem. Yeah. And I'm saying to me, like, for example, the media, you know, MSNBC, well, Rachel Maddow, for example, her show, she spent like, what, four or five months on the Russia uh, uh, situation. And I'm saying, you know, maybe her audience may have been interested in that, the people who watch it. But the average person I hear, most people I hear were not interested in that. Yes, it's like TV now has gotten a lot more just um, even the political channels are very segregated. I mean, when I say political, ideologically segregated, you know, MSNBC leans left. Fox News is right. You know, uh, CNN tries to go down the middle. Uh, you know, so I'm saying to me, you can actually get, you know, the, uh, 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 TV that is, yes, I think they do. <laughs> you know, I think they, they, try. they try to go down to the middle. <laughs> okay. They try to go down to the middle. Yeah, yeah, but I think that, um, 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 and I do think they do a little better job than both. Fox and MSNBC, and you know, and uh, I think it's clearly nice. MSNBC's <laughs> left. And uh, what did um, I say? I said, "Aren't you nice?" I, you know, one of the things that I have <laughs> dis I, I've debated with friends um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, over the last year, as we've all been stuck inside and spending far too much time watching the news or worrying about the news, is about divisions in the country and whether they are truly racial or truly ideological or 
are they perhaps generational instead? And one thing that I'm very interested in, you've done a lot of research on Gen X, which is not a generation that necessarily gets talked yeah. about very much. Um, does Gen, if, if we assume for a second, and we shouldn't because that'll make us wrong, but if we try to generalize and assume that baby boomers all feel a certain way and baby boomers tended to lean towards Trump, and Gen Zers and millennials tended to lean towards or tend to lean towards progressives. Um, do do Gen Xers think the same? Or do they? I know nobody votes or believes monolithically, but is there a define Generation X since you've done research on it? What what does Gen X? What are they? What are who are they? Who what do they think? Generation X are those of us who were born between 1965 and 1980. So we were the latchkey kids in many ways, and uh, we're the generation who primarily uh, were came of age during the Reagan years. You know, when I say I consider your teenage years coming of age, like 12, 13, 14, you know, preteen years. And we uh, spanned as well. It's interesting because the research I've done on Generation X, the most popular political figures among Gen Xers tend to be Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. And I think a lot of it has to do with popular the as in what, what we, I mean, I'm a Gen Xer too. So what popular in the sense that what we, the, the names we recall are popular in the sense that these are the folks that Gen Xers, those two politicians are the, are the politicians that Gen Xers tend to appreciate or respect the most. Exactly. The latter. Okay. And then because it was like, because, um, you remember the 1980s, the television show Family Ties. Of course. Alex, Alex P. Keaton. Alex P. Keaton was I mean, a Republican, was the, of course. He, exactly. He was like the, you know, the, like, the Listen, I still Republicans have my, and, and I still have my Just Say No t-shirt here somewhere. I know. I mean, I, okay, there you go. I think it's interesting, though, because I think I look back now as an adult and think, holy crap. Damn, he really screwed up the American economy, didn't he? For a long time. <laughs> but I do well, I think, see him as the grandfather who I grew up with, and I l remember watching his speech the day the Challenger exploded and thinking, this is mm -hmm. the king of America. And, you know, so it's interesting that you say that. I don't feel as guilty about having a soft spot in my heart for Ronald Reagan anymore now that you say everybody in Gen X tends to. <laughs> Well, but not 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 everybody. <laughs> but I think there was definitely. But I think there was definitely. Um, he was. Uh, he resonated. He was a great communicator. That was. The, they remember that was his term, the great communicator. And Ronald Reagan was among older, you know, Xers. I mean, I went to school with people who just revered Ronald Reagan when I started college in the eighties and nineties. I mean, people would actually want to physically fight you if you said something almost, you know they thought was despairing is despairing about Ronald Reagan. Uh, whereas younger Gen, Gen Xers grew up with, you know, Bill Clinton and came of age during the Clinton years, you know, their, their teenage years. So they I were don't more see anybody, I don't really see anybody, anybody fighting. If you say something mean about Bill no, Clinton, no, no, no matter no, how no, much I may no. love him, <laughs> but no, I ain't taking that, 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 that battle. <laughs> That say wasn't that, that say they like Bill Clinton. They, yeah, what you call the Reagan Democrats, and you remember they, they were called the Reagan Democrats. So, but where are those and, folks lying today? Where where are Gen Xers lying falling today? Are they more along lines of baby boomers, or do they? Um, I mean, obviously they're going to be split. But is there a? It, it seems to me as a Gen Xer that the line I'm 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 increasingly afraid <laughs> falls somewhere between Gen Xers and millennials because I find myself sort of resenting younger people now than, I'm, than I used to. Um, so where, where are we falling politically? <laughs> Please don't tell me I'm going to turn into a Republican. Um, no, no I think they said Gen Xers were more likely to, um, some of the strongest support for uh, Trump came from Gen Xers. You know, some of the strongest older Xers, Not unfortunately. But I think that um, whereas, but I think a large number of younger Gen Xers, I'd say those probably uh, born after 19 um, or the age group were probably the Gen Xers born after 73 were more likely to vote for uh, uh, Biden. More so why, what is that? So that's what I, that's what I would love to figure out. What is it that happened? I mean, obviously, you don't need to pinpoint a date or an exact ex exact. Um, event, unless there is one. But what is it that makes that that very blatant generational divide kind of happen somewhere mid 70s, where those folks before are just? I mean, what is it that those those older Xers and baby boomers and greatest generations that still are around? What is it that they saw in they see in? I don't want to talk about Trump, but they see in conservative politics or the Republican Party of today. Um, 
what 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 has happened? What are us younger Xers and millennials and Gen Zers doing wrong when it comes to um to are we should we be listening to the older folks more or should we be communicating better? Where's this generational divide happening? What's going on? I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I I, I think it's um more of a just it, it, generations you know different different people perceive things different. We're all products of our culture, our environments, and how we're raised. And I think a lot of that has, um, and some of it's probably just genetic. Uh, but I also think, too, that... Um, you think again, you think politics is genetic? No, no. And I I'm might have been adopted. That, well, <laughs> no, not politics. Not politics. But, I do, <laughs> but, that, but I do think, but I do think that, um, you know, we're influenced by our, you know, elders and the people around us and stuff. But I do think some people are, yes, I think as far as not j- politics, but I do, well, I do think some people are more politically, um, and this might be a dubious example to use, I think there are some people who are just bad people. I think they're in the minority, but I think there's some people, I think some little kids, and they, I think some people like serial killers and like that. There's, you know, they've grown up, they've had problems since they were little. I think there's some people who are just, you know, evil individuals. Now, I think they're in the minority, but I think some people are just genetically, you know, more likely compassionate than others. I think you see that with little kids, and you've heard mothers say, well, this one's much more this way they and that way, or he's a lot more competitive than she was, and vice versa. So I think certain basic characteristics, and I realize that's psychological stuff we're talking about here, but I think that, um, a lot of people, I think some things could be just genetically. So, yes, I think some people can be genetically predisposed to be liberal. And I think some people can be pretty uh, genetically predisposed to be conservative. Well, I, mean, I, was, genetically, I was genetically predisposed to be gay, and therefore I ended up uh, pretty well, quickly picking a party. <laughs> so maybe that's what you mean. Well, you know, I don't know about but there probably, there's, I'm sure there's gay conservatives, liberal conservatives, a, a political conservatives. Oh, so I don't trust think me, I, we've had a few I, of those I, on here. <laughs> um, we got a lot of great questions uh, written in specifically for you this week. Um, people who I think have read oh. some of your stuff um, or know you. Uh, and, and I usually don't take as many, but I want to take more tonight because there were some really good ones for you. Um, Chris uh, from Baton Rouge, except for my machine's not working. Okay. Chris from Baton Rouge um, says, Professor Watson, why do you think our politics have such a difficult... Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Hopefully I didn't read this wrong. Why do you think our politicians have such a difficult time handing sexuality? A lot of it, I think, has to do with their constituencies. And I think that's a topic they tend to dance around or they tend to dance toward their political districts. If they live in a primarily liberal district, they're probably more likely to promote or advocate progressive views on sexuality. If they live in a more conservative district, they're more likely to uh, espouse more. So do you think they may don't they maybe don't believe those things? They're just doing they're just saying the things that they need to say to get elected. Is that your are you tell you're telling me that politicians are only interested in getting reelected? Or is that what you're breaking news here? (laughs) <laughs> now listen, coach, play, play, now listen, I want you to hear this one. For some, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Paul, Paul from L.A. Uh, asks, does redistributive justice actually heal or does it divide? Interesting question. Does redistributive justice actually heal or does it divide? Um. I would say it does a little bit of both. I don't think it's an either or. Um, I I, mean, I, I, you you might need to define redistributive justice for me as you see it, because I have a, uh, I I may have a different definition of that than you do. I, but what is your definition of it? Well, no, I was you, assuming that it, I, when I hear the word redistributive, I'm I'm thinking of um, of reparations perhaps or but i don't know if maybe some people feel like um uh, tell me what you what how would you how are you answering it okay, I, well, that's how, I mean some people look at redistributive justice as far as um uh that uh that's what i tend to look at it as and i think to me um i think the people who would divide are going to be uh have already had their mindsets, my mind made up. But I think something like reparations, I think is uh, something that's well-deserved in this country. And I think it's particularly for indigenous populations and particularly for, you know, communities of color, African-Americans primarily. How would it, how would it be distributed? 
Now that to me, I think that's why I would uh, I would say it would be distributed not so much in a monetary compensation. Uh, well, let me take that back. I think for older African Americans, those who are probably in their 70s and 80s, those like that, uh, given what they've had to endure and live through, and they're probably not going to live long enough to see certain things reach fruition. So I would probably issue direct monetary compensation there for younger blacks and blacks under. Would you? Age, well, before you go to the younger ones, let me ask you this: Would you give the same amount to? Black men and women who lived their lives in New Hampshire and uh, Vermont <laughs> that you would give to black men and women in, in their 70s, 80s who lived through Jim Crow in Alabama and Mississippi and North Carolina and South Carolina. I mean, do you is there is there a is there a scale <laughs> by which these these things ended up end up being handed out? Um, and what about those who descended from people who came to America in the 1930s or 40s or 50s and whose whose parents and grandparents weren't um, grandparents and great grandparents weren't slaves or descended from slaves. I mean, do, is there is there a is there a way to quantify how much someone's how much the racism against one family or one individual is worth monetarily? Well, to answer your first part of that question, uh, yes, I don't care where you live in this country. If you're a black person of African descent, you still faced discrimination. So, you know, whether you lived in Vermont, whether you lived in Topeka, Kansas, whether you lived in Spokane, Washington, whether you lived in Biloxi, Mississippi, you still were a victim of racism. Also, because the law said you in a lot of places could not vote. You were still maybe whether you traveled here and there, you still were subjected to racial discrimination and you still were uh, the dealing with. Do you think do you think that an 80 year old in Georgia would feel the same would, would feel that way if an 80 or 90 year old in Georgia had to spend their entire first half of their life using a separate bathroom or walking in separate doors than than white people did not being able to sit at the same lunch counter not being able to go to school to the to the better schools do you think they would feel that what they went through is equal to what someone in a black person in Connecticut went through uh, in a state that didn't have Jim Crow laws. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying there wasn't racism because there's still racism now, clearly, and we but don't you have had a, you, you had redlining neighborhoods. You had, you had segregated neighborhoods. I mean, you know, you may have been able to shop at a, in, in a white downtown mall or whatever, but you couldn't live there. You could, your little neighborhoods, those neighborhoods were redlined, and they were also going through a lot of segregation. And within those, in the North, you still had a lot of what you call de facto segregation. You know, you may not have had, you know, uh, neighborhoods were still starkly defined by black and white and there were covenants in these houses where you could not live in these neighborhoods. But the I guess I'm just asking, I, I hear what you're saying. Right. Listen, I'm not saying that there's not, and I'm not getting, a, I'm not getting reparations regardless because I grew up a white man. So I, I get, I understand the but privilege, also, I understand the the privilege question, but I'm please. asking, don't you think you'd find that there would be people who grew up in the South who said, wait a second, the shit my family and my ancestors had to endure is way worse than what the families and the black people in Pennsylvania had to endure. Again, I, I, I mean, some, I mean, you have to, uh, maybe, maybe not, but I think they also realize that Pennsylvania is certainly not a was not it's not a necessarily a liberal state. Pennsylvania said heavily, you know, actually for for what for this work, Pennsylvania has more hate groups per capita than any other any other state in the nation. If you, oh, if well, you listen, know, I just to, grabbed a know. state, but it's, you're saying it's you're saying it's a fight and an argument you're willing to have because you think reparations are important enough that yeah, and it's a fight I'd be willing to have. And I don't think most black people, older black people, would make that argument. Quite frank, I don't think they would. I think they would realize too, no matter where they all realize that they were living in a nation where no black person, regardless of where they lived, was where life was not blue skies and apple pie. What, and but Paul from time, Los Angeles is asking, and I want to I want to make sure we answer his point. I'm certainly not assuming that Paul feels any certain way, but when he asks, does it divide? What about those folks who those white folks who grew up in Vermont and said, my entire family keep picking on Vermont for some reason, but who grew up in upstate New York maybe and said that you know my entire family, my entire life, I've never been racist. I've not. My family hasn't owned slaves. Nothing in my history was anything. Why should I have to pay tax dollars to these things? How do you? How much could it potentially divide? Um, if well, the point we is that maybe uh, whether you own slaves or not, the reality is you have benefited from degree of white privilege, and you you benefited from the degree of white systemic and systematic racism. Racism, which is in our country today, whether you've actively participated in it or not. What if you're living in a trailer and you're on and you're on welfare and you're a white person? 
you still have that white skin. Just because you're white doesn't mean you haven't lived a hard scrabble life or you haven't been in, you haven't been impoverished, but you still benefit from that white skin privilege and you still benefit from the potential of the reality of whiteness, what whiteness in this country has uh, has been able to, to to advance for you, to be able has been able to grant. Oh, you. listen, you okay. you're, you're, you absolutely agree with you on that. I have I have benefited from it for sure, but I know some some bitches around me who have not benefited much from nothing, and they are and and it. <laughs> They're worse off than about anybody I know. And I think they would argue, and it's those folks who end up voting. Those are the ones who are voting for Trump, who I can't convince otherwise. I can't convince not to vote for conservatives because they believe that I and Democrats want to take away from them and give to other folks, other people, to minorities. How, how, how can we convince folks that's not really what liberals want to do? That's not what progressives want to do. I guess you could ask them, what do you have right now that you what would have, that, what, 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 what is being taken away from you right now? Obviously, you don't have that much or you don't have anything. So how can you say people are taking anything away from me when you don't really have anything? Well, to them, they would to them, they would. No, I know. But I will say to them, I would imagine their answer would be. I don't have anything because I can't get a job because all those jobs have to go to someone who's who's not white. I mean, I'm not saying that these arguments are true. I'm just saying these are the arguments they would make. Well, I would tell them that your arguments are wrong in the sense is that as far as like, you know, immigrants and Mexicans, who's hiring these Mexicans? It's not other Mexicans. So the reality is, you know, so we're, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're, uh, you're pointing the finger at the wrong person. Maybe you need to look at the people who are being, look at some of these laws that are being enacted and who are they benefiting. No, you know, no, but listen, the answer people. to that is the, the jobs that, that immigrants, that illegal immigrants are taking are jobs that, People in America won't Most take them. Most people in America won't. won't, well, won't they do, won't. no it's matter what. They won't take them. They won't take them. They, it's not that they won't do them. They won't do them for the wages that They won't do them. Do they them. won't even show up to apply for the job to find out how much they're, they're you know, how much they get paid. I mean, they just cannot well, get people to do, I mean, they to do grunt, you know, manual labor. They can't get people to do it. But if the party, if the Democrat Party tends to be talking more about protecting those illegal immigrants and more about reparations or other identity issues, then uh, are we not doing ourselves a disservice? I kind of want to go back to the reparations question. We didn't quite finish it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Please. As far as um, how would that be distributed among certain groups, like uh, younger blacks and other groups, it would be in the form of affirmative action, uh, business development programs, uh, corporate internships along those, and those, along those that's how yeah. you know edu- free education scholarships you know or so, so straight up I mean, scholarships exactly. those type that would be that would be my that to me would be reparations they would be far more tangible benefits than giving somebody a one time check okay, and, perha- I, I want, and perhaps a little but, bit more palatable to everyone in general to right? the public I think because I think the public would see that as benefiting right. the social welfare. And everybody would be benefited from it. Yes, I think so. I think that um, that would be my form of uh, distributing reparations. Okay, is he from Brooklyn? A lot of big cities tonight. Is he from Brooklyn? What is the dominant civil rights struggle of the 2020s? Hmm. I don't know if there is one, but I certainly would say um, race. Um. Economic justice. Is it is it possible? Is it is it I mean, it's disappointing that there's more than one. Is that is the multitude of different struggles um, is the, the abundance of civil rights issues being addressed. Is it detrimental? to? Or do they cannibalize each other? Does that make it harder for any one group to find success, to see success, because there's so many other people or so many other groups fighting for the airwaves, so to speak? I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, there was it, it was obvi- it was very clear what the dominant civil rights stru- uh, struggle was in those years. And that was so much more effective on the ground and in Washington because there was so much focus on on. The need, those needs specifically ending Jim Crow and blacks right to vote and right to be educated and right to have access to, um, you know, that separate but equal is not, <laughs> it's not okay. Is there, is there an argument to be made that the fact that we have so many different struggles going on right now at the same time, is that, are they each hurting each other by taking airtime away from the other? Um, 
I think what is happening is, as you just said, in the 50s and 60s, they were just so much more blunt to see. It was just easier to find out what the major what the major issues were, and you could easily tackle those. And it was also easy to tackle, you know, a color and white water fountain and the color, you know, all black schools. That was much easier to see. Racism has gotten a lot more sophisticated. It's gotten a lot more, as I said, it's gotten more underground. It's gotten a lot more underground on some level. And I think it's much more, the problems are much more complex because you do have a lot more uh, various class uh, 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 issues to deal with. You've got more uh, other issues that have come into the, into the mix. And so I think it's um, not impossible to address those issues because they certainly can be addressed. And I think even with the problems that we're facing today in the 21st century, there's still nothing like the issues that our grandfathers and grandmothers and great grandparents had to deal with. Okay, the mountains that they had to climb to get where they were. I mean, I don't think we could even say that we have those same level of um, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 um, um, obstacles in front of us. I mean, yeah. Do Do you right. think that Do you think that younger generations agree with that? Um, I mean, do you think that there is? Uh, do you think that there is respect amongst? younger generations for the struggles that baby boomers went through and older, especially older Gen Xers went through. Um, I'm not a, a part of that, but um, it, with regard to all of these same situations, I mean, gay men in the early 80s certainly had it a hell of a lot harder than I did in the mid 2000s. Um, and black men and women in the well, pretty much anybody born before 1980 um, had it far worse when it comes to racism than anyone today probably could argue, or at least generally could argue. Do you think that younger generations have uh, respect for that? Or do you think that they see the problems that are facing America right now as um, more urgent and more detrimental? I think some do. I think some are very aware of that. And I think they do give appreciation to the battles that their forebears fought. I think some, I think a lot of young people, every generation, I think, but a lot of young people, until they get older, they kind of live in the moment. I think they see, I think a lot of times young people, everything revolves over, you know, everything you is for say. today. When you're a teenager, <laughs> Wait, everything has to be okay, done. Okay, hold on a second now, right Professor now. Watson. You have told me two things today. You told me that politicians sometimes just pander to their audience, to their constituents and only say what they need to say to get elected. And you've told me young people live in the moment and think about themselves. I am flat Ever guessed it here. <laughs> uh, 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 but I think that um, I guess we learn something new every day, huh? Is right? <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> but, I think, but I think that um, so I think a lot of that has to be. I think it's about the me, me, me. And I think that um, so in that sense, I feel that um, they do. But I also think that um, they're also. I think the older we get, we all you know we reflect and we look back and say, okay, you know um. You know, mom and dad were saying uh, at that time, now it makes a lot more sense, you know, because at that time I just didn't think along those lines. And It's painful you know, when you realize that. Can, it's painful. You know, exactly. But yes, I do. So, so I think a lot, to answer your question, I do think, yes, I think some do realize that, but I think a lot of them think the issues that they're facing right now in the moment are the issues that are much more immediate to them. And I think there's always been generational disconnects. You remember in the, in the 60s, it was like, don't trust anybody over 30. You know, that was, you know, that was, a, that was, a, you know, it's a generation until you get like 30, until you realize, you know, oh, shit, that's set like the bar too low. <laughs> people act like generational divides are always something new, but every generation's had this divide. That there's always generational divisions have never been. That's nothing new. That's since the colonial era. You know, in America, you've always said the generation, the, those young folks, those young folks, that when they got older, those young folks, uh, this generation. I know. That when generation. I, I know. I, mean, I, I know. I became too old when I started using that phrase myself. <laughs> so that's I think that's like, nothing oh, new. Shit. Oh shit! That's the, kind of the best way to answer that question. <laughs> well, we're living longer nowadays, which means yeah. you're not getting rid of us Gen Xers for a lot longer <laughs> than you thought. Yeah, exactly. So you better start being nicer to us. Um, keeping it real: essays on race and con in contemporary America. Um, that's your uh, latest book, is that right? Correct. You've written, and I got like, one coming out in September. Oh no, no, no! Tell me, tell me, tell me. Give us a give the us a one sneak in peek. September's called. Okay, well, the current one that you just mentioned, yes, Keeping It Real, Essays on Race and Contemporary America, was published by the University 
of Chicago Press. Okay. So, so not um, too shabby. That was thank you. And uh, the current one, the next one that's coming out in September is called Talking to You, Bro. Uh, liberating yourself from the expectations that society puts upon men in our nation. Oh, I might need to have you back to talk about that one. Because I feel like I've got a lot of expectations put on me, even though I'm barely a man. But, you know, (laughs) still, (laughs) it's heavy. Um, (laughs) Elwood Watson, Professor Elwood Watson, how the heck are we going to get along? Oh, it. You know, America's been through a lot of crises in this country, okay? So we've been through a lot, and we always manage to persevere and soldier on. And I have no reason to believe that we will not be able to get through, you know, whatever we... Uh, this is We're never going to live in a, a utopia, that's a given. But I do think we can still manage to... And I think there's hope for succeeding generations. I think, you know, I think we're getting there. I think, you know, the more diverse, uh, racially diverse and pluralistically diverse, whether it's race, gender, sexuality, religion. I think people say that's a divisive. No, but I think that's very, very unifying because it puts us in a situation where we're kind of forced on some level to acknowledge others' differences. And I think that does make for a better society. Some people laugh when we say diversity is our strength, but the reality is, yes, diversity is our strength. Let's just say, for example, all of us had the same aptitude and we all decided we wanted to be medical doctors. Okay, well, there'll be nobody teaching first grade children. There'll be nobody creating screenplays. There'll be nobody dancing. You know, there'll be nobody doing arts. There'll be nobody, you know, deciding to build buildings. And the world, if we all had the same aptitude and wanted to do one thing, uh, the world would cease to exist. So thank goodness we are all diverse. We have diverse interests because as soon as we all become homogeneous, homogenous, and what we want to do, we're in trouble, okay, (laughs) because the world's going to cease to end. So I think the more diverse we are, and I think that will also force us to acknowledge the differences and realize to begin to appreciate one another's differences and what we can bring to the table, I think that is going to be much more uh, advantageous. And we're certainly seeing that in entertainment today. We're seeing it in type of shows that are on television today that would not have been uh, uh, on TV probably 25, 30 years ago. So I think, you know, we're seeing that in the entertainment industry. We're seeing it in the fashion industry. We're seeing it in, you know, even in sports and in and other places as well. So I think in music, well, music's been kind of ahead of the curve on that for a while. But I think other areas, we've always seen that. And as you know, somebody who's on American Idol. <laughs> so I think that, um, but I feel that um, that is certainly uh, the more we acknowledge it and begin to uh, realize our differences, I think those racial animosities. They're never going to be totally eradicated, but I do think they will um, uh, 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 begin to uh, mitigate. I won't say disappear, but I think they will definitely begin to diminish and mitigate on some level.